When the hard stuff happens, I want you to get that if life was unbelievably easy, you would give up on it. I, I did a workshop yesterday, and for those of you who, who's there? Who's there? Excellent. I shared with all those people that the reason that my voice is like this now is that I've decided that to become the best speaker in the whole world, I have to sound like Tony Robbins. So, or something's irritating my throat. And uh, in any event, I want to share something with you guys. And I, this has been a challenging talk for me to kind of put together, and I've been thinking about it for quite a long time. I'll tell you why it's challenging. It's because like a third or a half of you have done Wild Fit. Another third or a half of the remaining people have been to a Wild Fit masterclass. And some of you have no idea what Wild Fit is yet. <laughs> and, and so you can imagine putting a talk together. What that means is I have to try and put a talk together that is going to have something interesting and new in it for the people who have spent three months to a year with me in some form. Then I've got to do something that'll be interesting for the people who have done like a really mas good master class with me but don't know a lot more. Then I've got to somehow get the basics in there for the people who have never heard of anything that I do. Challenge accepted. Hey. Challenge accepted. And so I really thought that what might be powerful is to share with you why it is that WildFit is so successful in the diet space, why it is that our completion rates are so high, and why it is that a year later, like people have been using, like, you know, sending me notes and going, hashtag WildFit anniversary, a year later, I'm still on track. You understand that's not how the diet industry works. That's not how it works. Statistically, the average person that goes on a diet gains three pounds every time they go on a diet and often their food habits get worse. The worst we get, every now and again, we get clients that go, oh, Eric, I've kind of fallen off the wild fit bandwagon a little. And I go, well, how far did you fall? And they go, well, I never will eat this again, and I don't eat that, and I don't even want that. And I go, well, how far did you really fall, right? You know, sure, there can always be room for improvement. So I want to share with you how that came to be. And, and, and the reason I want to share it with you is that I think some of the principles are things that you can apply in your life, in your business, in your parenting, in your relationships, in, in everywhere. We're going to start mostly with food, and I'm going to introduce something to you that I've been working on for about two years and that I've never spoken about publicly before. Does that sound good? All right. So I want to introduce you to something that I call the evolution gap. The evolution gap. The evolution gap as I define it, is the gap between our genetic evolution and our social evolution. So it's the gap between our bodies, our minds, and, and the way our civilization is evolving around us. And I want to share my theory with you that almost all human suffering, all personal human suffering, is because of this gap. Almost all of it. Every time we're depressed or sad or upset or angry in, an, in, a, in a, let's call it a, a non-productive way, is because of that gap. And I want to share how that gap kind of works. I want you to think that, this, like, just think about something for a minute. How long we've been on this planet in some form. My grandfather found the oldest, up until recently, the oldest homo sapien skill in the his, skull, sorry, in the history of the world. I, 259,000 years old. The pyramids are 3,500 years old. Just consider that. You know, and, and, and the truth is, we, we, you know, humans probably started something in the realm of five million-ish years ago. And our social constructs did not change a great deal during that five million year period of time. It didn't, it didn't change a great deal. So we evolved with those changes really slowly. And then, Suddenly, we started taking massive turns. We started making massive changes in the way we live, and yet our software and our hardware did not make those turns with us. It cannot turn that fast. Evolution is like turning a massive ship. It takes forever. We are about five, years in, five million years in the making. Like It's a massive process. It, 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 humans first encountered dairy products about seven or 8,000 years ago. And in that seven or 8,000 years, all we've evolved is that a small minority of people on earth are not lactose intolerant. That's as far as we've gotten. 
We've not evolved a nutritional dependency upon it. We've not even evolved the ability to not get sick from it. Some people have evolved the ability to not get immediately sick in their stomach because they continue to produce lactase and they can break down lactose, but they'll still get prostate cancer. We've not evolved to deal with that change we made. And so I want to suggest to you that some of the challenges that you might have in relationships, in parenting, in running your business, and in social interaction, stem from these differences, that your instincts don't match your life, that the messages that you're getting from your body, from your software, don't exactly match your life. Does anybody feel like that occasionally? Yes. Like, I'll give you an example. As a parent, uh, one of my least favorite things in the world is mom guilt. <laughs> I hate mom guilt. It's awful what guilt does to mom. You know, my, my poor wife, we've got the most gorgeous little baby girl, and she is vivacious and intelligent and fun and excellent. And you know what? Every now and again, we need a break from her. <laughs> Any parents on with that? <laughs> right? And so what happens is, and not only do we need a break from her, but she needs a break from us. <laughs> this idea that two people are supposed to raise one child by themselves is insane. <laughs> and it's brand new. Even two generations ago, even two generations ago, the grandparents would be there, the uncles and aunts would be there. That's gone. I know some of you still have it, but it's fast leaving. Elise and I, no grandparents help. My mother, not a baby woman. I, I'm lucky to be alive. <laughs> she was a fantastic mom. I'm kidding. She's just not really into babies. My, my, my mother-in-law, not a baby person. My, my, two, my, my, my father and my father-in-law, same thing. They'll be great-grandparents in a couple of years, but they're not helpful now. So that leaves us on our own. It was not meant to be there. And now, to make it worse, not only do we sometimes expect two people to raise one, but we expect two people to raise two or one person. Sadly, too often a woman on her own to raise one, two, three children. And then judge her when we see her on her own, that somehow she's doing something wrong. Go for it. I dare you to try it, one, on your own. Yes, yes. And you know why it's so difficult? Because you weren't built for that. I have been out, as many of you know through WildFit, to go and visit with the Hadza Bushmen on a number of times. I'm going again in a couple of weeks. I'm so excited. And it's like, you, we're ta again, just for those you don't know, what I'm talking about is proper hunter-gatherer nomadic people. They do not have money, they do not have cell phones, and they have no Google. <laughs> they know what they know. And I can tell you that when I've been in their camps, when I've been in their villages, because they don't move, I shouldn't even call it a village, because they don't have permanent placement. They don't live in one place. They move with the water, they move with the animals. And when I've been with them, I tell you, you come with me one time, here's what I dare you to try to do. Figure out whose child that is. <laughs> figure it out. I dare you. And then you're going, well, what if they're breastfeeding? I'll figure it out. Still, I dare you because they share. <laughs> they don't have the social hangups that we do. They, they, they want to breastfeed. They do it. <laughs> it's just right there. They don't have to have a special booth in the airport where we hide our women in shame. And so, many of the instincts that we have are a mismatch with the way we live. Because if you imagine 30,000 years ago, or if you're a Bushman today, right, the way we lived most of our genetic history, you've got a baby, say it's two-ish, toddler-ish, and it's crawling over here, and you're here, okay? No mom guilt. Make sense? Why should you have mom guilt? The baby's right there. Tiny bit of mom guilt. Because there are hyenas. A little more mom guilt. That's what it's for. It's not for you to feel this horrible, seething, knife-stabbing pain when you're not with your child, even when your child is doing something socially healthy for itself. Does this make sense? Yes. And yet mothers punish themselves with this. I got such a powerful lesson in this because our little girl goes to a little Montessori preschool, which she loves. Like in the morning, I have to go, uh, Zoe, bye-bye. <laughs> Zoe, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Like, the, she loves going. And so, so Elise sits at home and, and feels guilty about it. And I'm like, what, why? She goes, well, I should be with her. I go, do you want to be with her right now? 
Yes, then go to the school and be with her because the school we picked allows that. Do you want to be with her right now? And if she says, well, actually, no, then I'm like, well, why don't you enjoy the time you have now to the maximum? <laughs> no, no, you know why? Because the more she's enjoying herself, the more guilt she feels. <laughs> because there's hyenas out there. Because if you were this far away from your child and you started to get distracted by enjoyment, your child got eaten. And so your software says, don't enjoy yourself when you're away from your child. Do you get this? Okay, so let it go. <laughs> so, so let's do it with food. Let's do it with food, all right? I want you to think about food. Now, think of our evolution relative to food. Here's what we evolved to deal with. Food was incredibly rare. It was incredibly rare. In, in anthropological terms, we have this uh, measurement where you go, it's called calories per acre. It's called calories per acre. So what does that mean? It means how many calories are available per acre in your social construct. And so if you're like a totally uh, nomadic hunter-gatherer bushman, your calories per acre are very minimal. That means that every single day you're going to have to walk 10 or 15 miles minimum to get your calories per acre and all the other non-calorie nutrients you need. Does that make sense? Then as you come forward, we say forward in civilization, and you get to say the Maasai people. They are pastoralists, so they keep livestock, which means they now have hundreds of thousands of calories per acre around them all the time. They don't need to do quite as much work, except that the calories they have around them need to graze, so their calories have to move around, so they have to move with them. Then you go to agriculturalists. Well, agriculturalists grow millions of calories per acre, so they get to do nothing. They work very hard to plant and very hard to sow, but in the middle, it's kind of not so much work compared to being a hunter-gatherer. And now we're in Southern California where we live in gazillions of calories per acre. No, we live in gazillions of calories per bite. I would like, like Uber Eats, let's see. What would I like to get right now? Maximum calorie load, minimum effort. How's that working out for the population? You see, because what we evolved for was the rarity of food. We evolve not to starve. And if I look around America, I see some people doing a fantastic job of not starving. <laughs> Their body is responding well, packing it in just in case that drought arrives. <laughs> right? And so, so how does that happen? All right. Well, we evolve for this incredibly rare food situation. And then one day, I often imagine it like this. A couple of early people. And they're in camp one day. And they get back to, they get, as a matter of fact, they arrive at a camp that they haven't been at for about a year. And, and they look, they get situated, and then one of the guys looks over here, and he's like, hey, look at this. You know, that, you know that root vegetable that we really like all the time? There's this one gorgeous root vegetable I eat when I'm with them, and it's like halfway between a uh, sweet potato and an onion. And you can eat it raw, but if you put it in the fire, it's amazing. And so the guy goes, yeah, you know those things, the sweet potato, onion things? They're growing here. They never used to grow here. Why do you think they're growing here? I don't, I don't know. <gasps> do you know, I think that's where we left all the bits and pieces last time. I think that's where we dropped the, 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 the do you think we grew them? That's the moment that it changed. That's the moment we changed our relationship with food. We started to be able to control it. We started to deal with agriculture. We started to be able to grow our plants. Now, here's one of the problems that happens with that. I would like you guys to vote with me. There are two plants we can grow. One is a gorgeous, luscious, sweet-tasting watermelon explosion of gorgeousness. And the other one is kale. <laughs> Which one should we grow? Now, what I want to suggest is at the moment, at the very moment that they figured out that they could grow their own food, they will have selectively begun breeding for food that they enjoyed the most, not necessarily the foods that they needed the most. Does this make sense? That's where it starts going wrong. That's where it begins. And then technology comes in. 
technology comes in and they start being able to do stuff to food that they were never able to do before. See, you can't eat wheat. I dare you. I dare you to just take some wheat and eat it. (laughs) Try chewing that stuff. Go for it. You don't have the teeth for it. You don't have the digestive system for it. That grain has, has a hard shell on the outside. It has glutens in it. It has enzyme blockers. It has hormone triggers, all designed to fool the digestive system of a bird. Luckily, your teeth can't break in there, so you don't have a problem, right up until you figure out how to grind them into powder. You start grinding them in powder. Now you're introducing a new nutritional constituent into your diet and your digestive system doesn't quite know how to do with it. And weirdly, 15, 10, 15,000 years ago, we start seeing bone diseases properly for the first time in the fossil record and dental caries. And we continue to take this left turn away from our evolution. And our bodies can't keep up with that. Our body tries. A few people start becoming gluten tolerant. They're not the lucky ones. A few people start getting lactose tolerant. They are definitely not the lucky ones because they don't get the warning. Being lactose tolerant is like turning off the car alarm. That's what it is. If you drink milk and you eat cheese and it doesn't make you sick, I am sorry, I wish it did because then you wouldn't do it anymore. Does this make sense? So then... This left turn continues because we fast forward and we mass produce food and then pretty soon we need to start getting involved in regulation, government intervention. That's a good idea, don't you think? And so the government goes out and they hire this incredible food scientist to develop the food pyramid. Go to develop a food pyramid. Now, this is the, apparently the first food pyramid is officially Swedish, but I know the story of the American food pyramid. They hired this woman and they brought her in and she designed this incredible food pyramid. It was good. But they wanted to get some expert feedback on it. You know, it's a good idea, don't you think? So who should we get? Should we get the United States Dairy Association? Should we get Kellogg? Because we did. And the beef growers and the sugar industry, because we got them. And they took the pyramid and they turned it upside down. And the woman who created the pyramid said this, if you publish this pyramid, you will create an, an unbelievable epidemic of type two diabetes and obesity like you've never seen before. And they still did it. And she was right. Because our bodies are not built for this massive left turn. And not our instincts either. See, here's another one. Fruit was always seasonal. For our ancestors, it was always seasonal. And you know what's crazy now is that the whole keto movement has come along and vilified sugar. Sugar's evil, man. Look, English is a complicated language. It's complicated because you can use one word to say many different things with different meanings. So for example, is meat good or bad? I don't know. It depends, doesn't it? There's definitely some bad meat out there and there's definitely good meat, so you can't do it like that. You know, and and so we've done the same thing with sugar. We say sugar's bad. Well, no, our ancestors grew up eating sugar when it was available. I gotta tell you something, when I'm out hunting with the Bushmen, nothing will distract them more than a beehive. It is amazing. We're like totally on the hunt, hunting along. Oh, honey! Okay, everybody stop hunting. They crack the tree open and they hacking at it and the bees are swarming everywhere. Those bees don't sting, interestingly enough. They're tiny little bees and you scoop the honey out of the tree. Sorry, vegans, because there's bees in the honey, but it is the yummiest honey you've ever had. (laughs) And, And when fruit is available, they eat it. But then what happens is the fruit's not available and they're probably sad about that. They might even get a little low blood sugar. They might even get hangry. (laughs) But then they'll get over it as they pass back into keto and the craving goes down and then they won't even think about it again until the next ripened season. The trouble for you and I is that the food industry came along and noticed the evolution gap. They noticed that as long as we are eating sugar, we crave sugar. They have noticed that as long as we are eating sugar, We crave food generally. Sugar is now in 65% of the food that you buy on the shelves in the United States and most countries around the world. The average American eats 154 pounds of sugar a year. Pounds. 
It's a phenomenal amount. And so the food industry has like expanded and the government has expanded the evolution gap. The challenge is, is that your instincts, the SMS messages or the text messages you get from inside are, oh my God, I might be starving, I'd better eat the, I'm like how many of you have this thing? Well, I wouldn't normally eat that, but it's free. <laughs> that's not you, that's like, look, I know I've, I think I've shared this with some of you before, but help me out here. We gotta do some quick math. How many parents do each of you have? Okay, I know we live in this new world of great, interesting family dynamics. I'm talking genetic parents. How many do you have? Okay, so count back the generations with me. So at one generation back, two, then next, then? One thousand. Ten generations ago, a thousand great-grandparents. Are you with me? Carry on. Next one. Just go to 2,000. 2,000, 8,000, 16,000, 32,000, 64,000, 128,000, 256,000, 512,000, 1 million. 20 generations ago, 1 million people needed to meet without Tinder. <laughs> and they then had to have sex in order for you to exist. That means at least half a million, I'm hoping it was a lot more, at least half a million orgasms. I, I'm hoping more, but. <laughs> so. <laughs> that one simmers a little, does it? The point is that some of these instincts that we have, and you've got to imagine, like, those people live through the most unlikely environments, the unlikely circumstances. They, they live through incredibly difficult challenges. We live in the safest times in the history of times. I shared this with the, with the group yesterday. Like, in this room, about 20% of you, I've polled and polled and polled, about 20% of you have faced actual death. I don't mean theoretical. I don't mean the doctor said you might this and you that. I'm talking about you've been in a situation where in that moment you actually thought you were going to die. About 20% of you have had that. I've had it a few times. I was in a casino in the Bahamas when four guys walked in with automatic assault rifles and started shooting. That's scary. I've been standing in Africa with my camera and had two white rhinos make a serious attempt at my life twice. So I've, I've contemplated it. Only about 20% of you have had that. The other 80% haven't. That's great for you, isn't it? Aren't you happy you haven't had that? Go back three generations and how many of you would it be? All of you. Go back 10 generations and it would be all of you annually. Go back another 10 generations, it'd be all of you daily. Daily you would have been dealing with stuff. Daily there was a hyena over here. You know, a couple, a couple years ago, I did one of our Kilimanjaro adventures and, and, and at the end I was gonna go off and visit with the Bushmen and so I, I kind of extended an invitation to one of my wild fit coaches, Yvonne, and she came along and there were two of our Mind Valley photographers, like, Kirsty's here somewhere and Karen was there with us and she, they actually came with me to go visit the Bushmen. And it was interesting because I thought what I'd have to do, sorry, a little sexist, wrong I suppose, is that the women would probably wanna stay back at the lodge and I would sleep overnight around the fire with the Bushmen. You know, that was my mistake, that's what I thought. And Yvonne was like, hell no, she's German, she's tough, she's a wild fit coach, man. I'm coming out in the bush, and I'm thinking, well, these two, you, yeah, look, the two Estonian girls, they, they, I, there's no way they're going out there. They, there's nails that could be broken. If you see, they, they really take care, right? No way. They're like, we're in, we're in. I should have known. They walked up Kilimanjaro like it was nothing, so I should have known. And we're out there, we get there, we lay out the, 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 the sleeping bags, and then we discover a problem. I only have two sides. Because now we have to argue about who gets to me. Because suddenly the reality of it is in. There are animals out there. It's not here. You, you can feel unsafe in some, you can go to East LA and feel a little unsafe if you like, but there's a different, <laughs> there's a different unsafe out there. There's no cell phone coverage. And so all of a sudden we hear this. Whoa. And Karen goes, what was that? I go, it's a hyena. And she goes, what? How far? It's like five miles. She goes, oh, thank God. I go, yeah, that'll take it at least 20 minutes. <laughs> but in that moment, what they got to experience is what your ancestors lived with 
for 99.99% of your genetic history. And so that's why sometimes your instincts mismatch with your reality. That's why some of you have received a visa bill and thought you were gonna die. <laughs> so let's talk about how to close the gap. That's, how the, that's what the gap is. And that's how the gap gets created and how it impacts us. And that gives you an example with food, how it's happened. A little bit of discussion about how it can happen with parenting. By the way, do you think it's happened with relationships a little bit? Do you think? Do you think there's some things we're doing in relationships that are challenging our instincts? Do you think? It's interesting. So let's talk about how we close the gap. One is with awareness. Sometimes awareness is enough. It really is. Like all of a sudden... When I, when I was talking to my wife about what was going on with Zoe, I pointed something out to her that one of our very good friends was also sending her little girl off to a Montessori school a couple of years before, before the one opened near our house. And, uh, and what the difference was is that she was driving 45 minutes out to the school, dropping the child off for a two-hour lesson and driving 45 minutes home, but not right away. She was waiting at the school because it wasn't worth driving 45 minutes out, dropping the child off for two hours, driving all the way back. It just didn't make sense. So instead, she would sit in her car and read a book while her child was in school. Guess what she did not have? Mom guilt. She didn't have any mom guilt because she knew that what she was doing was good for the child. Does this make sense? The challenge is that when you start to enjoy your time away from your child, that's what kicks the mom guilt in. And once Elise saw that connection, she was able to let it go. It doesn't mean that your body won't keep trying to serve it up. It doesn't mean your body won't go, hey, mom, go. And then you got to go, no. And sadly, we have to go to logic every now and again to close the gap. We have to remind ourselves that we're not in this kind of danger. You know, do you, do you, is life happening for you or to you? See, like, do you really believe that? Do you really believe that all the time? No. And I want to give you an example of why I think it's important to really understand it all the time. I went to this obstacle course in uh, Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and, and it was an obstacle course that was about 35 feet in the air. And it was all these like, um, uh, like balance beams and little discs on ropes that you had to walk across. And you're 35 feet in the air. So if you fall, you're going to fall 35 feet, except for the fact that you have a safety line on. Right? So how do people walk across these things? How do you think? Well, this is how you might walk across the balance beam if it's like six inches off the ground. Fair? But what if it's 35 feet off the ground? How am I walking across it now? And this is how a lot of us are living. Because we don't have faith. We don't believe that it's happening for, to us. We believe that it's happening to us, not for us. So we're walking like this. Suddenly, I'm walking across this balance beam going, I, I must look like I have a disability of my, in my head here. But it's a balance beam. What's going on with me? Why am, I, why am I unable to see this correctly? I have a safety line on. And so I got to the beginning of the balance beam, and I said, how would I walk across this if I really knew the safety line was there, that I was able to ignore my instincts that are telling me I'm 30 feet, five feet off the ground? I thought, well, I'd walk across it normally. So I did. I walked across it. I got to the next one and it was these little discs that are all on and they move and I just walked across those. I did all the course like that, the entire course. The guy who runs the course, this little teenage kid with his you know, like pimply face and geeky glasses and he comes up and he goes, how long have you been coming here? And I said, this is my first time. And he goes, but you've been to the other ones. I said, no, I've never been on one of these at all. And he goes, but th th how did you do that? How do you just walk across it like that? And I go, dude, there's a safety line. So what if you did that with your life? What if you got that there's a safety line? Always. There's a safety line. And, and, and the problem is so many of us are walking around with these ancient fears, these, this evolution gap, this my ancient instincts, ancient fears, and I'm terrified when you have the most incredible safety lines around you. We have social safety lines. We have family safety lines. We have financial safety lines. We have bankruptcy laws. We have governmental systems. We have safety lines upon safety lines. We live in the safest times ever. I'm not saying there is, that there's no danger at all, but the danger that you actually live with is infinitesimally small compared to the danger that your DNA thinks you're living with. And so your DNA, DNA keeps saying, dangerous, dangerous. 
And so that's why when the food manufacturer puts food, when they put sugar in your food, it triggers a message in you that says, "Uh oh, fruit's available, but it might be gone soon. Eat some more. Eat some more. It's an old message. So the one thing we can do is become aware of it. So here's a, here's a, here's a game I'd like you all to play. I'd like you, for those of you who have not done WildFit yet, for those of you who have done WildFit, you've done this before, do it again. Go grocery shopping and look at the labels and observe where sugar is. Where is sugar in Rice Krispies? Where, what place on the ingredients? It's not first, come on, it's <laughs> breakfast cereal. Where is it? Second ingredient, where is it in cornflakes? Where is it in Frosted Flakes? It is first. It's first. It shouldn't even be called Frosted. It should be called sugar with corn. It's insane. And so what we need to recognize is that they're playing upon our old instincts, this evolution gap, and, and, and they're profiting from it. So when you read the ingredients, you pick up a jar of tomato sauce and you go, oh my God, sugar's the second ingredient. My what? What I want you to do is what? take the jar and just smash it on the floor in the Whole Foods. If you do that enough, they'll stop stocking that stuff. Okay, now, what I'm really saying <laughs> is don't buy it. Don't look at it with disappointment. If you look at it with disappointment, if you look at it with disappointment, you're going to eat it. Oh, man, I wish there wasn't sugar. Disappointment, emptiness, little, oh, little food devil. Well, it's not your fault. <laughs> right? Yeah, this is what I want you to do instead. I want you to look at it and go, what? WTF? <laughs> Get angry about it because it's there to manipulate your cravings. It's there to stimulate your appetite. It's there to get you to eat more food. So get angry when you see it. Do you know, we can go and lobby the government all we like. We can try that. We can go and pressure our congressmen or our senators or what have you, and some of them are incredibly proactive. But if we really want the food industry to stop putting sugar in everything that we eat, we have to stop buying it. Or smashing it on the floor would be good too. <laughs> so here's something else, is to actually pay attention to your emotional ride when things are happening. Your emotions, they're just a bunch of life coaches. Tell me some of the good emotions, good emotions. Happiness, joy, love, anger. What else? What are good emotions? Shame, guilt, pride. They're good emotions. As long as you're using them and they're not using you. I look at emotions like this big team of horses. You can ride them or they can take you for a ride. Joy, joy is a really easy horse. You jump on Joy, and Joy's like, hey, we're going for a ride. Woohoo, Joy! It's awesome. It's excellent. But if you get on anger, and you don't have anger reined in, anger rides you under low branches. <laughs> Isn't it true? Shame. Shame's a tough one, isn't it? But here's the thing. People going, oh, shame, it hurts, so it's such an awful emotion. No, it's not. It's an emotion designed to make you a fantastic human being. The difficulty is the rules with which you bring it on. It's the rules with the, that, you, that you use it with. So, so here's an example. Are there different rules about, say, sex relative to shame in different countries around the world? Yes. Yeah. Is the approach to sex different in America than in Germany? It is. It's different in a variety of ways, not, not normal ways. You go into a gym in Germany. I went there. I was staying at the, the Hyatt Hotel in Cologne, and I walk in to go to the gym, and I, I, they had these like saloon doors. I open the saloon doors. I walk in, and there's these like women standing there naked. I'm like, oh, walked into the wrong one. Walked out. Walk over. Go, where's the men's changing room? We don't have one. It's unisex. Okie dokie. <laughs> I can live with that. <laughs> but, the <pro> <laughs> but the problem, but the problem, the problem is when shame gets in the way, when shame gets in the way, when shame holds you back from saying what you really wanted to say, from asking for what you really wanted to ask for, 
for being who you really wanted to be. And, and, and so then people go, I wish I could get rid of my shame. No, you just want to train it. You just want to get it under control. You just want to rein it in. Because if you live, has anybody ever met somebody with no shame? That's just unpleasant. It's just unpleasant. So what we have to do is notice that our emotions evolved over the last several millions of years and our environment has changed dramatically in the last 15,000 years. And so that means that our emotions are not always the most accurate representation of the coaching we need in that moment. Is that true? And so we can bring some consciousness to that. So here's another example with food. And those here in WildFit, you'll be familiar with this, but it's called the food timeline. The food timeline. Okay, now how many of you, this is an odd question, but how many of you have ever eaten some food for a reason other than your physical sustenance? <laughs> oh, oh, everyone. Okay, all right. So in other words, that's a fancy way of saying, how many of you have stuffed your face full of empty calories that had nothing to do with your sustenance but had everything to do with you thinking it was gonna change the way you felt? Who's done that? Okay. So, and by, just, just for fun, what are some of the foods that do that for you? It, 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 or used to, for those of you who are in WildFit who used to do this for you. Pe ice, cream. ice cream, peanut butter, chocolate, pizza. All right, we know what they are. We know who the usual suspects are. So, all right, so here's what's going on. Is it possible that a person is feeling not great? Is that possible? They, let's say they're feeling a little lonely, a little low. And then, and then their food devil goes, how about a little bowl of ice cream? <laughs> and their angel's going, dude, like I've already, like I'm gonna have to get new belts if we keep doing this. <laughs> yeah, but it's just this one time. <laughs> okay, you say that every time, I'm not gonna fall for every time. Yes, you are. And you give into it, right? Now, that, you know, I know many of you don't anymore, but many people do. Now, here's what I want to ask you. Let's say on a scale of zero to 10, you're feeling a zero emotionally. You're in the bucket. You're in the bottom. You're feeling bad. All right? So here you are, not feeling good. And then, how good is the ice cream going to make you feel? Really, truly, how, how, how good do you believe it's going to make you feel? 10 at least, if not more. If it's haagen -Dazs, 11! It's gonna do it, it's gonna do the trick. And so, excellent. Now, here's the real interesting thing, though. You're at zero. Your food devil and your food angel are arguing about that. Ever notice, the food devil has a number of personalities. Like, I, I discovered the other day a new one, but some of the ones that I've been aware of for a while, like, how many of you can't stand whiny teenagers? Anyone whiny teenagers? Like, don't raise your hand if they're with you. Jeez. But, like, whiny teenagers, right? Nobody likes that. Really? Because the next time you're trying to talk yourself into eating something that you don't want to be eating, I want you to listen a little closer because I think you are the whiny teenager. I want you to hear about, doesn't your food devil kind of go, oh, come on. The other kids are doing it. <laughs> doesn't that happen? Whiny teenager, that's one personality. Then, then there's another personality and that's the drug dealer. That's the drug dealer. That's like, come on, just one Cinnabon. Just one, you don't even have to finish it. <laughs> and these ones are free. Right? And then I discovered another one the other day. This woman comes along, she goes, I don't have any food dialogue. I don't even talk to myself about food. I got nothing. I got no food dialogue happening here at all. And I go, well, how does it go? She goes, I walk into the kitchen. I, 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 it says, go get some cake. I go, okay, who says that? She goes, I don't know. Well, so you got some food dialogue, somebody saying something. And I said, describe to me, what is it like? She goes, well, it's just this voice. And it says, go get me some cake. And I go, oh, she's got a, her food devil's wearing that wife beater t-shirt with food stains on it. <laughs> Woman, give me some ice cream. Yes. <laughs> right? So, so we've got these different food devil personalities. And the more we can become aware of them, because some of you, over the next couple days, your food devil's going to talk to you and you're going to go, oh man, that's what Eric's talking about. <laughs> and it's going to begin to give you consciousness about it. Is it true? 
All right, now where was I going before I told you about the food angel and the devil? <laughs> food timeline. And so here's my question. You finally give in to the devil. You decide you're going to do it this one time. When do you start feeling better? When do you start feeling better? Do you feel better when you have the first bite? Do you feel better when you smell it? Or do you feel better the moment you gave yourself permission? Do you get how dangerous this is? It was never the food that made you feel good. It was the permission and the rebellion. And as soon as you gave yourself permission and rebellion, you released serotonin and dopamine and you started feeling good. And then you ate the food and you linked the food to the feeling good just like Pavlov's dogs. And this happened to you when you were six. And it's still happening today. The food never made you feel good. Now, unfortunately, it'll amplify it because these high calorie, high sugar food, you know, eat it in and it will double your serotonin production. It'll double your dopamine release. And so now you'll feel even better. But how will you, and you guys, some of you have played this game with me before. We're about to order pizza and ice cream. For those of you who have done Wild Fit, it was the old days, it was before. We're about to order a bunch of pizza and ice cream, and we're going to celebrate. We just won the big game. We're about to order it. Everybody, when I count to three, make the sound that represents the, f the food celebration that we're about to give ourselves a big treat. One, two, three. Yes, we're very happy about it. Everybody, in a count of three, make the sound that represents the way you feel an hour and a half after eating the pizza and the ice cream. One, two, three. And that's the other part of the food timeline. And that's why we need to figure out how to close the evolution gap because so much of our life is set up that way. Our instincts are kicking in to deal with the present and they're hurting us in the long term. Does this make sense to you? Yes. So I want to leave you with this thought. I want to leave you with the thought that the past is the past. That it really happened and it happened without meaning. You gave it some meaning. Your parents gave you food. They told you you were a good little girl because you finished your whole plate. How dangerous is that? They told you that because you fell down and skinned your knee, I'm going to give you this cookie. And love and sweetness all got attached to it. How dangerous is that? That happened to you, many of you, and other things in this conversation. And what I'm going to ask you to recognize is that the past is now gone. And the meaning that you created back then is not the truth and that tomorrow is a fresh day of creating new meanings and new consciousness where you can really take a look and recognize you are living in the safest times in the world and you have a safety line on. And so from now onwards, instead of teetering your way through worrying, is that business deal going to happen? Is that guy going to call me back? Why didn't she text me? What's going on? Why is everything so scary? Instead, I'm going to ask you this. For those of you who have played video games, what is your favorite part of the game? the hardest levels, the boss, the hardest level. Isn't it true? And so for at least the next three weeks, I have an exercise for you. It's this simple. When the hard stuff happens, I want you to get that if life was unbelievably easy, you would give up on it. You would give up on it. You would never read Jim Rohn. He always said, if you picked up a book and in chapter one, nothing serious happened, you, would you get to chapter two? And if chapter two, nothing serious happened, would you get to chapter three? Absolutely not. And so don't ask for life to be easier. Ask for you to be stronger. And so the next time something comes along and the wrong phone call happens, you realize it wasn't the wrong phone call. The next time a food craving kings up and you go, oh, I've always done this in the past. You go, no, that was the past. I'm now creating my future. Does this make sense? Yes. And so that's the, 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 the goal for the next week. Something tough comes along and pushes your emotions, makes you angry, makes you upset, makes you uncertain. What I want you to do is just this. It's a very simple exercise. So I've just received bad news, which is really a way of saying that the video game just said, level up. Do you, are you with me? So, so everybody with me, you want you to, want you to, I'm going to say level up. You're going to go level up and you're going to, you're, going to walk, you're going to do what I do. And that's what you do for the next week when you level up. Are you ready? Okay, it's like this. You go, you, this is the, I'll show you the old way first. You go, you go like this, level up, bad news comes in. Right? That's what we do. No, no, not anymore. We're going to go, level up, 
Okay, with me now, one, two, three, level up. Awesome. I got this. Thank you guys so much. It's been a real treat always to share with you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much.